Hello YouTube train bubble, hello Twitter train bubble. So another physics video on request. Um, so the question was, can you stop a runaway train by hand? So just with your bare hands. And uh, what better place to discuss that than at a railway. So I'm here at the Dampfbahn Fränkische Schweiz where I help out a bit. And I'm working on this thing, or at least hope to work on this thing. A uh, little small inspection vehicle powered by a small Volkswagen engine. And this is basically a Volkswagen Beetle on rails. So, question is, uh, why do trains run away at all? And can you stop them with the bare hands? Short answer to that question is, of course, no, don't even try. You die a horrible and painful death. And if you're lucky, your corpse can still be identified, but um, don't. Simple, don't. Um, general safety thing, don't put your feet on the tracks. Get, stay off the tracks at all. Even on a heritage line where you know the trains regularly run only on Sundays, there are inspection trains, there are work trains, and being on the tracks is not only forbidden, it's generally dangerous. So don't put your feet on tracks and not even for that Instagram photo with you with a guitar on your bag and a luggage and something. First, this picture is so cliche that it's really awful. Uh, and the other thing is it's bloody dangerous. So keep your feet off the track and keep it that way. Only way to walk on tracks is if you're trained to do so, have safety instructions and there is definitely no train coming and you have clarified that with the train operation company. So, um, that's for safety, um, let's start looking at the trains. Train brakes, as they are used today, are using pressurized air and they were invented by Westinghouse in 1869, I think. Um, and the theory is still the same, so while the technology has improved a bit, it's still the same basic principle. Before 1869, you had just these mechanical brakes, um, which needed human operation, so in every um, carriage you had a breaker man, or brake man, I don't know what the English term is. Uh, who had to wait for a signal from the engine and then had to shut the brake. These brakes are still there today. This is the handbrake of the train. Um, problem with the pressurized system is it uses air pressure, um, a system of interconnected uh, high pressure, low pressure things, and this only works when there is a compressor working. So when you put your train somewhere uh, and there is no engine connected, the brakes are closed for about an hour or so and then the air pressure leaks out and the brakes open again. Uh, the system is designed in a way that if the air pressure is going away when uh, the train is running, so on a high pressure operation mode, as soon as the brake pressure tubes break or uh, something goes open, the train stops, the brakes close immediately. But this only works with the pressure difference, so um, as soon as the pressure difference is gone, brakes open again. And if you put your train on an incline, it runs away if you haven't put on your handbrake. And this is quite often the case when a train runs away, somebody forgot to put in the handbrake. Usually the rule is half an hour you can go on air, maybe an hour, but don't risk it. Put on the handbrake at least in every second car or every third car. There are specific regulations on each railway for that. The air pressure is generated on the engine uh, with a compressor and between each cars there are these tubes which leave the air pressure to each car to some 
um, storage containers where you have high pressurized air stored and this connection is going through the whole train. As soon as this connection is broken, the train stops. So if the pressure on this tube goes away, um, the brakes are released, which gives you one way of safely stop the train by hand, cut this connection, or at the end of the train, you can have some kind of a pull-off valve here. So there exist pull-off valves, which you put on here. They have a long rope, and if you walk next to the train and want to stop it in an emergency case, you can just pull the rope off. Uh, this is used sometimes in shunting, but um, general safest rule for shunting is have somebody there maintaining the handbrake. So now let's have a look at the brakes of this diesel unit. Um, this is a VT135 uh, from 1937, I think. This is the brake cylinder of the um, diesel unit, which pushes on this lever system. The one on the left goes to the front and this one goes to the back. Um, so we just follow it. So lever here, bar goes to this lever and this lever then goes one to the left side and one to the right side here and I don't know if this gets in focus yeah so this is the lever and this is directly connected to the brake pad so lever brake pad so the standard way to stop a train is the main brake. Um, this is a steam engine. It looks roughly the same on a diesel engine. On a modern engine, it definitely will look different. But you have here the main brake valve. And these displays are the brake pressure. So the lower one is the brake pressure in the tubes going to the um, carriages. And the upper one is the pressure in the main um, pressurized compartment or the main air container and this thing here is the brake valve so this is a brake valve made by Westinghouse actually so in Germany usually it's Knorrbremse but there are also some Westinghouse brakes Another way to stop a rolling train or a runaway train are these beasts. They're called skids. You place them on the rail like this. The train wheel comes here, presses that on the, on the track, and, and it skids along the rail and therefore creating friction and the train will eventually stop. Uh, these are used for shunting or for securing a, a, a train which is just parked somewhere. And the problem with these things is if you, if you stop a rolling train, they sometimes come off the tracks and then they're shooting around like a projectile and um, these can easily take away your leg. So you don't want to be near one when it flies off the track. At the end of a track, you have these things. Um, they're called bumpers or buffers, um, I think in English. In German, it's Prellbock, um, which just shows you how sweet and soft the German language is. Um, these are basically just a bar um, and some holding structure which is fixed on the tracks. So they're clamped on the tracks. They're not clamped absolutely tight. So when you bump into them, they move a bit. The idea is that they absorb the energy of the train. So you bump into it, the, everything slides a bit further on. But by creating enough friction at the rails, um, they absorb all the kinetic energy from the train and the train eventually stops. Which means as a train driver, it's not a good idea to bump into these things. So um, if you break your engine, do it before the bumper, else you will skid it a bit further on and then a maintenance crew has to come and push it back again. And this is a lot of work. So, um, if everything fails, at the end of the track, there's a bumper. As a physicist, um, this is a lot of real life, so, and real life is complicated. 
Uh, so usually physicists leave the real life to engineers and uh, we just calculate in models. So let's just check, can you stop a train by hand uh, as a single person? And uh, let's calculate that in a theoretical model or many models because you can simplify a lot of things. You can start with spherical trains and spherical people in vacuum. So, without further ado, let's get back to the paper. So, I'm back from the real world, back in my nerd cave. I've prepared some healthy stuff. There's greens in it, so it must be healthy, probably a salad. And so, let's start calculating things. So we should start with the spherical train in vacuum. So we have a spherical train and a spherical person trying to catch it. We have a spherical train and a spherical person. Let's say the train is just shortly run away. So it's at five kilometers an hour and the person is at rest and um, let's not take a train because this is too heavy so just start with one carriage uh, two hours um, which is something like 18 tons and this person is 80 kilograms so pretty average person a bit lighter than me just assume these are spheres and they are completely rigid so there is no deformation happening so then we have an elastic scattering. For elastic scattering um, you have these initial velocities and masses and then um, the impulse or the momentum of the train is transferred to the person or part of the momentum is transferred to the person and then the person is shot away. So uh, just to get a rough idea what happens. Uh, the final velocity of the train after the scattering, so V1 prime is 2 times M1 V1 plus M2 V2 divided by M1 plus M2 minus V1. And the same goes for V2 as the person, 2 times M1 V1 plus M2 V2 divided by minus V2. So V2 is zero, so all this goes away. And we are left with 2 MV1, M, uh, M1 V1 divided by M1 plus M2 minus V1. And the same for M2. So if we put in the numbers, so this is two times, M1 is 18,000 kilogram times V1 times 5,000 meters per hour divided by M1 plus M2, 18 or 80 kilogram minus 1,000 meter per hour. And V2 is the same, but not V1 is 5,000 uh, 5, meters per hour. So this is just 2 times 1,800 kilogram, 500 5,000 meter per hour, divided by 18 or 80 kilogram. So just simplifying by hat, this and this number is roughly the same. So this is 1. Uh, which gives uh, the train basically runs at two times 50 km, uh, 5 kilometers an hour minus 5 kilometers an hour is roughly 5 kilometers an hour so the train doesn't uh, change at all and this is the passenger is two times 5 kilometer an hour is 10 kilometers an hour so if the train and the person are perfectly rigid spheres in vacuum and they just bounce into each other like, like snooker balls, then the train just continues with 5 km an hour, it will be slightly slower, so there's a, this is 1% or yeah, yeah, something like 1%, half a percent slower and the person will be kicked away with 10 kilometers an hour. This is kind of a snooker situation. And from, just from this calculation alone, you see it's not a good idea to stop a train by hand. 
Uh, in reality, of course, persons and trains are not spheres in vacuum and they are also not completely rigid. A train is relatively rigid, a person definitely isn't. So this will be more unelastic scattering and then this just means the person sticks on the engine. So now let's get a bit more realistic. Um, our train. And we have a person. The train moves with the speed, RB, and the person just sits there and then when it's pushed, generates friction. The person pushes on the surface with the normal force, which is just the weight of the person times gravitational constant. And the friction force it generates is the normal force times a friction coefficient and this friction coefficient for rubber on concrete. So we have rubber soles on a concrete surface um, as a kind of model um, is just 0.5. If I put in now the standard equation for linear motions and linear um, accelerations and so on and want to calculate the stopping distance of all this um, I've done that on a paper before, so I don't show you all the way to do it. It's just basic mechanics 101. I get for the braking distance mass of the train divided by this friction force times v square divided by 2. And just putting in all these numbers gives me train mass train speed squared divided by person mass, gravitational constant, friction coefficient, and two. Which, if I put in the numbers, so I have train mass or carriage mass is 18,000 uh, 18, kilograms. Um, I have an initial speed of five kilometers an hour or roughly 1.4 meters per hour, uh, per second. Um, so this gives me 1.93 meters squared per second squared, divided by 80 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared, times 0 0.5 times two. And multiplying all this out gives 21 meters. So this is much shorter than I thought. So of course, um, speed is squared here and mass of the train is linear. So um, if I have two carriages, I already uh, am get 42 meters. If I move from five kilometers an hour to 10 kilometers an hour, I get 84 meters. So this gets really big really fast. Just for curiosity, all this friction generates heat, so um, actually does do the, the soles of the shoes catch fire when you push along this person? So let's just calculate that. So the energy generated by this friction is just the friction coefficient times the distance times the normal force. So we have 21 meter, that's the distance, times 0 0.5, times 80 kilo, times 10 meter per second squared, gives in total 8,400 meter squared per second squared kilogram, which in normal terms is known as joule. So eight, eight kilojoules, so it doesn't sound too much. Um, this eight and a half kilojoule then generate a um, temperature. And the temperature is usually, um, it's the heat capacity times temperature difference um, is the energy. So if we solve that for um, temperature difference, we get and substitute heat capacity by specific heat capacity times mass of the shoe soles which I think we can assume something like 500 grams. We get specific um, energy divided by specific heat capacity by mass, 
which is this 8400 joule divided by the heat capacity of specific heat capacity of rubber which according to wikipedia is 1420 joule per kilogram um, kelvin times 0 0.5 kilogram multiplying all this out gives 11 kelvin so the temperature of the shoes of the soles just rise by 11 degrees so unfortunately no burning shoes so no funny slapstick so what you see from that is in theory you can stop a carriage by hand um, you just have to stand very still for 21 meters and let the train push you over tarmac or concrete or the at least the carriage so um, when when you get heavier this gets longer when the train gets faster this gets uh, also longer by but even with a square of the velocity so um, Double the velocity gives four times the uh, braking distance. The big problem there is, I'm assuming here you're a box and you don't topple over and everything's very smooth and, and so on. But on, on real life, you're on the tracks, there are sleepers, there's ballast, there's a lot of stuff where you can topple over, which is what usually happens. So um, when you try to stop a train, you topple and you fall and then the train runs over you. So while theoretically possible to stop a train, it's not a good idea. So you've seen from the calculation, theoretically it's possible to stop at least a runaway carriage. Um, a complete runaway train, definitely no way. It, this also works the other way around. So you can push a carriage. Um, it's, it takes time and uh, you need to push really, really hard, but it is possible to push a carriage by just your muscle force. Um, at the Dampfbahn we tried this also with an engine and a whole physics class could pull one engine out of the shed. Short version, it is possible to stop a train, don't. Please don't try. Instead of subscribing and whatever and donating coffee and, and whatever, I just would ask you to um, lend a hand on your local heritage railway, uh, donate money, go there and ride them. They all have uh, really suffered by COVID. Most of them are just financed by selling tickets and by not being able to run for more than half a year, a lot of them have lost a lot of money. They, um, they require that money. So even if you're not running, you need maintenance, you need work. Some of the heritage railways have uh, people working on salary for them, making bookkeeping and, and maintenance work and stuff like that. So um, buy vouchers, go to the heritage railway and help out as a volunteer and just support them wherever you can. And the same goes for any other cultural things or any voluntary cultural things. A lot of cultural stuff really, really suffered in the last month. So instead of subscribing to my channel, please donate something to cultural things or heritage railways or anything else which was affected by COVID. As a summary of this video, you probably would have guessed you can't stop a train by hand. You might stop a single carriage under certain circumstances if it's moving very, very, very slowly and uh, you are uh, very lucky. But in general, don't. Don't try to stop a runaway train by hand. Uh, this thing is heavier than you, it's faster than you, and it will kill you. And if you ever encounter a runaway train, I think the safest thing is to run away and scream. And if this doesn't help, then scream louder. Um, there are various ways people who are trained to do it can stop a train, but usually there are bumpers somewhere. And a damaged train is not as bad as losing your life. So I hope you enjoyed the video and have fun and enjoy Paul Whitewake, uh, Whitewake's Abandoned Railways. Enjoy Gareth Dennis with his rail netter and a lot of other really interesting YouTube channels on British rails, some on German rails. So have fun. <laughs>